This year, Larry Bridgesmith took the helm as the chair of the Center, NASBA Center for the Public Trust. Larry also serves as a senior fellow and associate professor at the Institute for Conflict Management at Lipscomb University. He's president of Creative Collaboration and practiced law for over 30 years. Larry, that was a great auction that we had yesterday. Wonderful response. Uh, tell us a little bit about what CPT has accomplished and uh, hopes to do in this next year. Thank you, Billy, and thank you all. Uh, we just are overwhelmed at your response at the auction. You, you know David Costello. He is one of the most exuberant, that's his nickname, enthusiastic and optimistic people you'll ever encounter. He was hoping for 50 people and $20,000. And what you did with well over 200 participants and $44,000 is just amazing. <laughs> And you know, it's really lovely to be in between Milton Brown and David Costello on the agenda because usually you can count on getting a kiss from Milton and a kick in the seat from David. So it gets you going both ways. Uh, and I, I'm so sorry, I don't know if Sir David is still with us. I'm a lawyer. And, but I'm a lawyer in recovery, okay? So, hi, I'm Larry, I'm a lawyer. You're supposed to now say, hi, Larry. Thank you. Now we'll get on with the recovery system. But I notice that the older I get, the more I have these imponderable questions, and I have to answer or get answers from the most unlikely sources. So now that I'm with a group of accountants, there's a question that has been just troubling me for at least a decade. Why is it that when I go out of Word or Excel, it asks me, do you want to save your changes, when I know I haven't made any changes? Can you help me with that? That leaves me very, very insecure. I don't, know, I don't know why that would be, but maybe you can help me with that. You know, the, the annual report's theme is momentum, and momentum requires forward progress. Or if you have no forward progress, momentum means you're just standing still. And I have to tell you that this has been an incredible journey for us at the CPT, the Center for the Public Trust, because momentum has become our byword. First of all, show me, are you wearing your wristbands? Who's got their wristband on? Thank you. Thank you for those of you who are. But let me tell you why I'm wearing mine and why I'm proud to wear this. I've never put a wristband on before. Uh, I've, you know, there are lots of causes out there. Some of those wristbands, you begin to wonder if people still wear them, really are concerned about the character of the people who prompted their creation. And so when someone asks me, why are you wearing this wristband, I want to be able to say, see what it says? It says trust. And trust is something that is of unique character that I'm not even sure we have fully begun to fathom. Because to me, the word trust is more than simply ethics, although it includes ethics. Trust is something that our world, I believe, is craving and doesn't know how to find. It has lost its ability to trust leaders, and CPT exists to help promote and recognize the trustworthy. But we have to define what it is that we mean by trust, and work that we have done at the CPT this year and in years past, I think has begun to illustrate something that we can begin to hang on to, because trust is competence, but competence alone is not enough. You can be the best bicycle rider in the world. You may not be trusted. My wife trusts me uh, implicitly. In my work, I occasionally have to have breakfast or dinner with a lovely woman of professional competence, and she trusts me. She knows that she can trust me. But I'm not necessarily competent in all ways to do everything that she would need. If she, for example, had an appendectomy attack, she wouldn't trust me to take care of that for her. So there's a level of competence that's a part of trust. And you must add to that the concept of character. And so when the whole concept of trust is comprehended, I think we have a better handle on what it is that we're trying to do at the Center for the Public Trust to both illustrate, educate, and recognize where trust can be found and where trust can be relied upon. Tell me what you think these three pictures have in common. 
Everybody recognizes that. The Beatles, Abbey Road, the, the mythical dead Paul with his bare feet. You know, the stories were just legion. I'm sure you know this face. Wealthiest man in the world, I think, still, Bill Gates. Great philanthropist, fabulous leader of an organization that we all rely on, and Mozart. What do all of those three people have in common? Well, if you read Malcolm Gladwell's The Outliers, you know that what they have in common is a question of time. Because what each of them did was spend an enormous amount of time acquiring the skills of their trade before anybody knew who they were. For each of them, it was at least 10,000 hours. For Mozart, although he was composing at four, his originality really didn't surface until 20. What he was composing was the rework of other people's works until he's 20 years old. So he was practicing his craft of composing, and the greatest of his works didn't really appear until another 10 years after that. So without that dedication of time, there's no Mozart or the creativity of Mozart. The Beatles. Do you realize that for several years, between 1957 and 1964, before any success came their way, they had spent years in the Biergartens in Hamburg, Germany, performing and performing and performing before audiences who didn't have any idea who these people were and had no idea that they would ever be famous. Over one period of time, they put in 1,200 performances nightly in order to hone their craft. And then we think in 1964, when they become famous, that they just broke on the scene. They didn't without 10,000 hours. And we know the reality that Bill Gates was one who, as a child, as a seven-year-old, spent untold hours in a private school where his parents placed him playing in the mom's computer room until the moms ran out of money. And that as an adolescent, he and his geek friends initiated this agreement with the University of Washington to try out software. And while in high school, they negotiated an agreement with an information services company for free computing time. Over a seven month period of time, they put in 1,500 hours or eight hours a day, seven days a week, learning how to do what ultimately would make him rich and famous. I say all of that to say that the Center for the Public Trust has taken flight. And it's thanks to the people and the hours invested in it, such as David and Milton and the board that has served, the staff of NASBA, Alfonso and Lisa and Jen and others who have given enormous amounts of time. But I calculated the hours this year, and I totaled 10,000. The CPT has taken flight. And now it's time to see that we can help it move to where it has intended to go. I don't know if you know the reality that uh, yesterday was the 25th anniversary of a great movie, or actually a great movie series, Back to the Future. And you can buy on Blu-ray the boxed set of three movies, Back to the Future sequel. And the, the question was asked of the cast and crew today on the Today Show, why was Back to the Future so phenomenally successful? So phenomenal, for example, that Michael J. Fox could be approached by monks in Bhutan as they try to articulate the language back to the future. They pointed at Michael J. Fox. They recognized him. And the, the, the cast was asked what made this movie series so great. And one of the cast members says, it stands for the proposition that people come to decisive moments in their lives and they have a choice. And that choice that they make will define them forever. And then she went on to say, and we need to teach our children that. If you don't remember that premise from the movie trilogy, maybe you're a candidate to go buy the Blu-ray box set because it truly has focused our attention on the consequences of decisions that can change the course of not only our lives, but the lives of many others. 
And so that's what we're trying to do at the Center for the Public Trust. One of our initiatives, the, the Student Center for the Public Trust, got launched in grand fashion this past year. Our first center at Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee, has resulted in a great deal of enthusiasm and participation on the part of many. Next week, we launch our, our uh, opportunity with Baruch College. And in New York, we will have our second chapter. We're in conversations at the present time with a variety of other colleges. Some five colleges were spoken with in Colorado last week. Jen is spending all of her time on the road. Colorado last week. San Antonio this week, California next week, where she will meet with other colleges. We are in partnership with the Oklahoma Centers for Student Competition in Matters of Ethical Businesses, and we will be supporting their work this coming year. But one of the things that has come out of the incredible work of students seeking to define business trust is a competition that was conducted this year in Middle Tennessee. And among the competing schools were Fisk University, Lipscomb University, um, Tennessee State University, and perhaps Middle Tennessee State University. And it was a phenomenal experience because what came out of that was a work product that you would be proud to see and produ produced anywhere. And so Ryan, if you'll show us the uh, winner of the student competition, Thank you. I'm as confident that's as good as anybody in Hollywood could produce, and it just grabs your attention. And coming from Nashville, Tennessee, we know something about water, its excess and its absence. And I think the fact that we had the opportunity to see someone capture the moment in terms of its essential nature in such a compelling way and com compare it to the work that we seek to do in creating trust was really phenomenal. And undoubtedly, this coming year, with more chapters coming online and our footprint getting bigger, that video competition will only increase and become something of national significance. In December, we will return for the fifth time to Baruch College, the Robert Zicklin Center for Corporate Integrity, for the fifth occasion of the Ensuring Integrity Conference bringing together incredible leaders in the areas of accounting and auditing and compliance to dig really deep in how we can better ensure the public trust. For that, we are deeply grateful. And that brings us to the opportunity that others have been asked to join us. The Accountants Coalition has become one of our advisory board members and carrying with that a commitment of financial support as well as a commitment to engage in the dialogue to help us to be even more focused on how to engender trust. The question then for all of us is how can we advance this work of the Center for the Public Trust? You can do so by filling out a form and getting a, a, a wristband and hoping that people ask you why you would care to wear that. You can do that by taking that piece of paper that's on your, on your table in front of you. And if you'll notice, there's no contact information being asked. 
All we want to know is from you, what are your ideas about the creation of a membership group for CPT in terms of what makes most sense? We won't take your fingerprints. We won't ask for your email. We won't follow up with you in any way. We just want your counsel. The reality is that there is a world that is craving the resumption of trust. I don't know anyone anywhere that is better positioned than this group with the support of NASBA that has been so generous and so forthcoming over our short period of time, our 10,000 hours prior to takeoff. We have an opportunity to change the world and help people truly understand that trust is something that can be quantified and counted on. We simply hope that you'll trust us to do so. If you have any questions, happy to entertain them. Otherwise, we'll turn it on to the next part of the, the program. Thank you, Billy.